Today on Rambling About Cars, new Ford Bronco Raptor, new Toyota Sequoia. We're going to talk about that a little bit, but the real magic is coming a little bit later with our special guest, who's an insanely talented artist. He's in the automotive realm. He's got automotive art, sci-fi art, just amazing stuff. And we're going to find out all about him. So without further ado, it's podcast time. I'm Christopher Smith and, you know, Mr. Chris Bruce. I'm right here. So, yeah, we are going to hit the news first. Our guest, John Fry, is going to be with us later. Um, we only actually recently learned out that technically he works for Honda, so he can't really comment on auto news. So Smith and I are going to hit the auto news, and then we're going to talk all about his art. And uh, we'll be showing some examples during the show. He is an insanely impressive artist. Also, he's an instructor for at the concept car institute or at the concept institute for vehicle and mechs which is the coolest job title ever i want so. that to vehicle and mechs i mean mechs is, yeah. is there anything better i don't know that there is yep. but we should we should probably get started here with a little bit of news before we get to the good stuff Absolutely. this might be this might be the good stuff for some of you but honestly we know some of you listen over uh, over audio only we will have some of uh, some of the automotive art, the, the Instagram stuff uh, for our guest posted on our mm -hmm. website. But if you do have the chance, you want to go to Motor One Podcast YouTube channel where you can see some of the stuff that we're going to be talking about. And it starts with the news, at least right now, with the Toyota Sequoia. Yep. Brand so, spanking new. Finally. Yep, the, holy <laughs> The previous gen toy. To yeah. Toyota Sequoia, sorry. It's uh, okay, you can't for say it, I can't spell it, so. For the 2008 model year, it actually debuted at 2000, 2007, I believe it was at the LA show. Um, I'm going to pop up here. This is a video that um, our colleague Clint Simone did. You definitely know Clint. He has been mm -hmm. a guest on the show. But he did a complete walk around of it. This will be muted, um, but we'll talk about it a little bit. But the new uh, generation, third generation of the Toyota Sequoia is finally here. And like I said, it has been a long time coming. This is this is an ancient vehicle by modern automotive standards. So uh, the interesting thing about it, especially to me, is that it is riding on uh, the Toyota new generation architecture, TGNA, F platform. And F is their body on front a body on frame platform that is also under the Tundra that is under the Lexus LX 600. And that is under the new land cruiser. So this is a vehicle that is in many ways related to the land cruiser. Um, we're not getting the land cruiser here. So if you, if, if you want that Toyota badge, if you don't want that Lexus version, this is kind of the next best thing. And it has a lot going for it. Um, so under the hood, you've got a 3.5 liter twin turbocharged V6. Um, if you're familiar with the new Tundra, that's also under there. This is the hybrid version that Toyota calls the iForce Max engine. And that makes 437 horsepower, 583 pound feet of torque. And you can only get that with a 10 speed automatic. Um, there will be both rear wheel drive and four wheel drive versions available, depending on your preference. Um, there. Um, and also it can tow 9,000 pounds, which is pretty impressive. Um, mm -hmm. I was the one that wrote this story up and I looked and I believe it puts it right in between an expedition and a Tahoe in terms of towing, at least as I remember, I didn't put that in the story, but I believe that's accurate. Um, also we don't have fuel economy numbers yet, but Toyota in their press release says it is a huge improvement over the previous generation. And for anyone who did for anyone it had a big naturally aspirated v8 it got 13 point uh, 13 ga uh, at why can i talk i'm nervous about our guest 13 <laughs> miles per, i am 13 miles per gallon city 17 highway 15 combined and that was with the rear wheel drive version and they're saying significantly better so significant you know. but but i mean when you're talking what was that 15 combined yeah i mean when you're talking 15 combined significantly better I mean, they, they could say, oh, it's like 25% and it's like three or four more MPG. I mean, it, it we'll, we'll see. I mean, it's going to be better. I mean, Absolutely. look, look, the old Sequoia was was old. It was seriously old, especially in the SUV realm where yes. competition is so hot. Automakers are updating their models like major updates every 
three to four years facelifts, sometimes just, you know, a couple of years for this going back to 2008. I mean, it, it was certainly a long time coming and I like how they have very distinctive trim levels. The mm -hmm. you, you, you don't get a Sequoia anymore. Um, that just looks like every other Sequoia trim level. I mean, they've Toyota, it's not just a badge. I mean, they've, they've taken some steps to try to differentiate their, uh, their different trim levels. Absolutely. There are five trim levels. There's SR five, which is the base limited platinum TRD pro and capstone, which is the range topping model. Mm -hmm. So in everything they have shown so far, we have only seen TRD pro and capstone, but those are probably going to be the models with the most significant styling differentiation. Mm -hmm. um, TRD pro, you get an led light bar in the middle of the grill capstone. You get a ton of Chrome everywhere. They, you know, there are similarities, certainly, but the trim is completely different. Um, and yeah, they're good looking trucks. Also with TRD Pro, you get a lot of off-road gear that you don't necessarily get in other models. Uh, you get Fox internal bypass shocks that aren't on the other models. You get a quarter inch thick front skid plate. You get, and then this is optional on some of the other ones, but uh, locking rear differential, a multi-terrain select system, crawl control, downhill crawl assist. Um, it's just, it's a lot of stuff like that. But then if you go capstone, you get kind of all of the luxuries in the world. You get 22 inch chrome wheels. Uh, you get semi aniline leather upholst upholstery that, uh, at least for now only it comes, comes in black and white, but it looks really good. And, uh, for trim, you get open pour American walnut wood. So, oh, sorry, real quick. I, I just noticing this. Um, the capstone is also the only model in the lineup to get acoustic glass in the front doors. So it should be extra quiet compared to the other models. So they're really acoustic differentiating glass. the different grades of the Sequoia this time. It, to me, it almost seems like they realized, okay, we don't have a land cruiser anymore. We have to have a vehicle that can both fill a niche of if you want luxury or off-road and they happen to ride on the same platform anyway. Here you go. Here's a little bit of everything, depending on what it is a buyer wants. Yeah, I feel like Toyota is really taking taking it seriously with the new Sequoia. Um, the old one languished for so long, and yeah. but I mean, it still had a decent cult following. I mean, it still had it still had a fairly strong base. Um, it did, especially like that yeah. V8 engine. People loved it because essentially it ran like a hammer. You just couldn't kill it. We uh, obviously it's way too soon to know that about the twin turbo three and a half liter V6 yet. We just it's not in enough products, so we'll have to wait and see. But yeah, people love the old one just because it was it was old fashioned. You know, it didn't have a lot of the men amenities that uh, modern vehicles have, but it was reliable and it did what it needed to do. And it'll be interesting to see whether the new one can do that, too. And if you're not a fan of just touch screen everything. I like the fact that you get in the interior of the Sequoia, you still have a lot of manual controls and there's a big mm -hmm. shifter in the center console. You have yep. quick access buttons for climate, for stereo. I mean, obviously they still have their touch screens, um, but I feel like Toyota is really, I think they kind of did their homework on this, Bruce. They know the segment pretty well. They know what buyers are looking for and, and the larger SUV segment here. And I, I think this is going to be a really good, competitive vehicle for him. I agree. And I, I want people to go read. So our coworker, Brandon Turkis late last week, it was either Thursday or Friday, put up uh, his first drive of the Lexus um, LX 600. And, you know, that is the vehicle that also rides on the same platform. But he was talking about when he was talking to Lexus people that they wanted a vehicle that could appeal to Land Cruiser orphans. And that's exactly what they called them, <laughs> Land Cruiser orphans. And it feels like this is the other side of the coin of that, that it, maybe you don't want some of the luxury features that you get in the LX 600 that the new Land Cruiser especially in like TRD pro trim or some of the other like higher end trims, it's, it, it, uh, it's a lot of land cruiser. And I think they're, you know, they got rid of that vehicle from this market, but they kind of replaced it with two vehicles that are still on the same platform and are doing a lot of the same things. Yeah. Um, be interesting to see how the pricing shakes out, how, uh, yeah. how it ultimately does in, in the big segments. 
Uh, do we want to move on to the other big debut here that uh, that took place recently since we were last on the air? Let's do it. Well, I don't know if anybody knows this, but um, Ford came out with a new Bronco a couple years ago. Um, and really, Bruce, since the Bronco returned, I, I don't think it was very long after the Bronco returned, we started seeing photos of an even beefier, bigger Bronco that for a while we thought was called the Warthog because there were, there was some documentation that had leaked that said Bronco Warthog. And it's like, yeah, and it's like what's Bronco be, Warthog. There's, there, there was a leak saying that it might be like a vinyl seat package, which you think about a Warthog right. that like plays in the mud and stuff. So maybe it's one that you can hose out real easily and stuff like that. But yeah, it Raptor is going to be what it's called. And know. and and of course, that's what we have here now. The Bronco Raptor is official. It has debuted. It has over 400 horsepower. I, I don't know why Ford does this. How long have you been developing it? I mean, come up with a number. It's it, I mean, I can't believe that they're still trying to do tests to determine, well, should, should it have 415 or should it have 420? You know, I don't know if it's, if it's on purpose to just kind of tease things along, but the takeaway is 2022 Ford Bronco Raptor over 400 horsepower. It doesn't have a V8. It doesn't have the 3.5 liter. It's got the 3.0 liter twin turbo V6. It's the same engine you get in the Ford Explorer ST where we know it makes 400 horsepower there. So in the, in the Bronco Raptor, um, Ford gives it a, a special true dual exhaust system. There's additional cooling um, that should help with the power. It, the, there's going to be like... Ford was a little ambiguous as far as engine tuning, but they said it's it's tuned for performance in the Raptor. So What's whether the number it's, in your head, I'm thinking four fifteen. I'm I'm thinking it's I'm thinking it should be a little bit higher. I I would like okay. to see four. I would like to see four fifty. Oh um, wow, that's that 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 would that, I will be surprised, but okay. That that would be a hefty number, but that's a big number. But, Folks are already looking at this and saying, well, the Jeep Wrangler Rubicon 392 <laughs> makes 470 horsepower and it's got the Hemi V8 RRR. So I think I, I hate to, I hate to be that guy, but I think Ford has to, I think they have to put up a little bit more here just to help differentiate from the, the Rubicon 392. Um, that's not to say that the Bronco Raptor isn't amazing. Um, when we got Ford's press release, the press release mentioned the engine. Mm -hmm. Um, but then it just went on and on and on about the suspension and, Which is um, that that's, I mean, that's obviously the big takeaway here is the suspension. Um, we're anytime you get a media photo from an automaker showing their vehicle four wheels in the air over a sand dune. I mean, that's, that's, that's a cool picture. I, I wanted that picture for the leaf for the article, but it was just a little bit grainy. Um, Ford says that they really kind of took inspiration from the Ultra 4 uh, racing series, which I, I don't know if, if you've heard about that. Um, the, they have the uh, the event. I'm trying to remember what it's called. The like like the 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 fall of the hammers or something like that. It's it's a really grueling kind of off road series. Um, so you've got upgraded axles, you've got upgraded suspension. It gets a similar damper setup to what you get on the F-150 Raptor, a bunch of sensors that monitor travel. Um, the, the total suspension travel, I think is up. I'm going to have to look at the article because I can't remember this stuff. The, uh, the suspension travel, 13 inches in front, 14 inches at the rear. That's an increase of 60% up front, 40% at the back over the base Bronco. The stance is 8.6 inches wider, just, just from the axles. But overall, it's 9.1 inches. No, sorry. It's 9.8 inches wider overall, thanks to those fender flares. And that's why you've, you've got the little uh, the little amber lights up in the grill. Obviously, it has the Ford-branded grill like you would see on the F-150 Raptor. Um, but they spent a lot of time talking about that suspension. Um, to make the suspension work, they also reinforced the, the suspension towers. It's got a full boxed frame underneath. It's considerably stronger overall versus the regular Bronco. Um, 
aside from the photos of it jumping through the air, I found this very interesting. They also included a series, a bunch of photos showing it crawling over rocks and they were emphasizing that it has a little bit better of a crawl ratio um, for crawling over rocks versus a Bronco automatic. Um, the manual is still the way to go if you really want ultra, ultra low crawling. Um, speaking of which, sorry, you can't get the manual in the Bronco Raptor. It's, it's stuck with the automatic. Not necessarily a bad thing in this case. It's it's still a good box. Um, pricing, if I remember correctly, it's under seventy thousand um, dollars. Sixty eight something something something, right? It is okay. Yep, <laughs> it's under seventy thousand dollars. Once you include the destination charge, sixty nine thousand nine hundred ninety five dollars. Who? <laughs> How about that? It's under 70 grand, folks. 69 dollars sure is. But that's that's like five grand less than the Wrangler Rubicon 392. Now you're getting again 470 horsepower, but is the Rubicon 392 gonna be as capable off-road as the Bronco Raptor? I don't know. I mean, I, I feel like the Rubicon 392, yes, I, I know they tweaked the underpinnings on that a little bit. But I feel like that was more of a, hey, let's put the V8 in the Wrangler like everybody wants. And wow, look at us versus Bronco Raptor, which I think is, is a is a better all around vehicle. Um, they've done a lot of work on the suspension to make this thing properly airborne worthy. Um, anytime you see like I said, anytime, anytime you see an automaker sending out press photos of their vehicles in the air, I want to emphasize that because from an automaker standpoint, there are gobs and gobs and gobs of people just ready to sue you for for just <laughs> anything you can find. Was and it the first gen Raptor that was a? They had all of the issues with the frames coming apart from the beds. Am I making that up because of the photos? I I can't remember that, but I know the first gen Raptor. I mean, when that came out, it was for if i remember they had had to kind of dial the uh the hype back a little bit because oh, maybe that's they, they were like this thing i mean you know the suspension you know it's it has kind of like this baja feel and and you can go down trails at higher speed and maybe get a little bit of air and then people yeah, were like i'm gonna jump it like 30 feet in the air and there was the infamous video of somebody just going full send in the raptor and yeah that's like, exactly like what i'm thinking 15 yep. 20 feet in the air and guess what it's still a heavy ass pickup truck that drives on the street. And it, I mean, it landed the front wheels, smashed the fenders. I think it, I think it bent up the frame. Yeah. It's like, that's exactly the one I'm thinking of. Yeah. yeah I mean, no, no folks don't do that. Okay. Um, but that's still, that's why I say it's impressive to me that Ford includes photos like this of, of the, of course it's not that far off the ground. Right. Um, it's but a, yeah, I mean, 70 maybe grand, a foot. I'd call it a foot. Of course, I mean it. It has um, it has upgraded body panels. It's got the the super wide fenders, but it's not just flares. Actually, the the front and rear quarter panels are completely unique to the Bronco uh, Raptor. The hood is unique to the Bronco Raptor. They give it a little bit flashier trim inside, um, but yeah, the Bronco Raptor is here. And now I imagine people are going to be saying, "Well, Ford, when are we going to get the Bronco Raptor R with a V8 that we want?" I've, I've still seen people commenting, oh, I should have had a V8. And it's just like, no, you know what? No. The, the twin turbo V6, if they, well, at 400 horsepower, it's going to be, it's going to be plenty fun in that vehicle. Mm -hmm. If they do take it to 450, I don't think they need to beat the regular Rubicon, but if they can get pretty close, that'll be enough for people to, to compare. Um, and yeah, I think it's going to be a superior vehicle off-road as well. My question for you is, are they going to build a few two doors? Obviously, no. at launch, there's not going to be. But say two years down the line, production starts kind of waning down. We're getting ready to retire it. You know, there's a refresh coming up, something like that. Do we get a two-door? No. I don't think Ford okay. will ever do this in a two-door. Um, for one, I think getting a bunch of extra power in the two-door and the shorter wheelbase is going to be a little spooky. And then, Anybody who's driven a two-door Wrangler or ridden in a two-door Wrangler with such a short wheelbase, anything happens on the backside that causes it to step out, you need to have like fighter pilot reflexes. They are they are a bit dicey. They I mean it's I'm not comparing 
a two door Wrangler to a Porsche 911 because they're two completely different genres. But just like, you know, especially the older air cooled 911s, a little bit of a learning curve to make sure you don't kill yourself. There's a little bit of a learning curve on those really short wheelbase Wranglers. And I imagine you're going to have the same learning curve on the Bronco two door. Anytime you have a short wheelbase like that, um, it, it, it'll, it'll get away from you if you have too much power. Short wheelbase, narrow, short, stubby vehicle. Awesome for crawling off road. You can like drive between trees. You can, you can drive in areas that you couldn't get your, your four door, your longer one. But when you have a lot of power to deal with, oh, that's a little frightening. So no, I don't think, I don't think you'll ever see, I don't think you'll ever see a Bronco Raptor two door. I think it might happen. I think I'm not saying mass, I think limited production towards the end of the model line. I think Ford might say, we'll build a couple of them. I, mm. I could be wrong. We'll see. All right. Well, I, I tell you what, I tell you what, I'll wager you five bucks. Deal. That's the difference that's, between. That's, that's, <laughs> difference. That, that's how far we are from $70,000. Yep. So it, it's, a bet. It, it's a $5 bet. It's a $5 bet that you heard right here, folks. Uh, me and Bruce Ford, you better not build a two door Bronco or I'm going to send you a bill for five bucks. <laughs> <laughs> I, yeah, or, sure. or I'll make you come on the podcast and drink shots of hot sauce with us. Ooh, that's more threatening. Yeah. <laughs> that's, that's I know Ford like... has five bucks in their pocket, but they might not want to do that. <laughs> Do we real quick want to do some BMW stuff since we're just kissing our kind of time limit here before our guest joins us? Yeah, let's. Uh, we can gloss over it really quick. Um, okay. There's there the were new three BMW embargoes just for anyone listening who that came out on Tuesday, pretty much right on top of each other. I think they were all within 15 minutes of each other. So yeah, which do you think? Do you want to show show the green and gold just because it's so ugly? <laughs> Well, it, it is ugly, and, and there's there's an interesting story behind it that I, I won't share all the details of. Of course. Uh, but this it. is this is the BMW X2 Edition Gold Play, and Gold Play is because it gets a lot of gold trim. Um, the grill surround is gold. The mirror covers are gold. Sorry, I, I'm not pronouncing this right. The mirror covers are gold. The trim on the wheels are gold. I love gold. It has gold, weird geometric striping on the side. It has some more gold trim inside, but only for European market vehicles. This is coming to the United States, but it will significantly tone down the gold trim on the outside. It'll still be called gold play, but you're only going to get the gold trim on the wheels and you're going to get some gold touches inside, but it also oh, comes grill. I thought the grill was still going to be gold. Nope. Nope. You won't have the golden grill. Oh, um, you okay. won't have the golden mirror covers. Mistaken, you'll, you'll have the 19 or optional 20 inch wheels that have some gold trim in there. Um, you will also get, um, the M it has M sport, uh, some upgrades on it. Uh, suspension is upgraded. So it sits like almost a half an inch lower. Um, it has some body colored and some black trim on the outside that goes with the, just the sportier appearance. It has M sport seats inside. Um, I mean, just a, Hey, just a neat little special edition that's coming out later this year. But uh, as we were doing this, obviously, I mean, we had, we had assets for the international edition. Um, Which is what we're looking at here. Yeah. And yeah. Yeah, I, I want to make that clear. We're looking at the international edition. The, the This won't be available in the United States. Actually, if we zoom in on the wheel, okay? Let's okay. let's go back and let's go back and zoom in on the wheel. Show me Boom, the wheels. We're, we're, we're zoomed in. That's available in, in the United States. That's what you'll get on the BMW X2 Gold Play edition. The wheels with the trim. The other um well, I I take that back. Um, the X, the, the gold play edition is also the only way you can get the new San Remo green metallic exterior, which is a which brand I new like color, color for the I X2. I just don't like the gold with it. I think that well, color is okay. Well, then you're, the, you're in luck because for the United States, for North America, you're only going to get some gold trim on the wheels really on the outside. And then, and then more gold, which is going to be yellow on the inside. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, that's, I mean, that's kind of the, the it's not really a new model but hey it, it's a new addition from bmw um bruce we also had some just some eight series updates 
We did. I'm going to hit this super, super, super quick because we're kind of running yep. up against our timeline here. But um, so the 8 series got a styling update. The M8 also got some uh, updates. I wrote the M8 story, so I'm a bit more familiar with this. So that's why I'm telling you about it. Um, you now get uh, the shadow line uh, details inside the headlights. So it adds some dark accents. They look good, honestly. It's, you know, it's a minor thing, but in terms of what you could add in terms of what bmw could add easily that that's something uh also several new colors uh skyscraper gray brooklyn gray isle of man green and then if you go the individual B or bmw individual color palette tanzanite blue and frozen pure gray uh if you're looking at us on youtube this is the tanzanite blue um, which is a very attractive color. I would really like to see it in the Isle of Man green. I think that would look really good. Uh, other smaller changes. So the center infotainment screen, rather than 10.25 inches previously, it's now 12.3 inches. And then also as an option, you can get um, the BMW M carbon uh, seats. And uh, those have um, uh, full merino wool upholstery with some Alcantara trim. Um, they're also electrically adjustable and heated, but apparently they do still save some weight versus the regular seats. And if you get that, you get additional Alcantara trim on the dashboard and the door panels. Um, so, you know, minor changes, but it's something. Uh, prices uh, carry over from last year. So uh, $131,000, we'll call it, for the Coupe and Grand Coupe, $141,000 for the convertible. Um, and production of those will begin in March. So I would suspect uh, deliveries will begin a few months after that. All right. Sounds very good. Um, at this point, I think let's go ahead and jump over to our special guest here. Um, Bruce, why don't you go ahead and give us an announcement? John Fry. And um, I'm very, very uh, interested in interviewing him. He is someone who I just discovered. And if you listen to the last episode, you probably heard this probably eight to 10 months ago. And he's just such a fantastic artist. And it was only just recently we found out that he actually worked for Honda. And we're really looking forward to it. We're probably not going to talk so much about his Honda work. In fact, that's probably going to be like a second or two. We're more going to talk about the way he works in sketching cars and rendering cars because what he creates are vehicles that never existed. They're not real vehicles. They're kind of all these fanciful designs, but they're absolutely wonderful. John Fry, he is an uh, let me make sure I get this title right. You are the principal designer digitally of digital modeling and the visualization team at Honda America. Is that the correct title for you? That's right. Uh, digital modeling visualization, which is the DMV. <laughs> so, no one uh, wants to be at the DMV I except your DMV. DMV. You yeah, that, cool that's. DMV. That DMV is much, much cooler. Well, thank you so much for taking time to be on the show. We are very, very excited. Um, and not just because Bruce and I are both kind of sci-fi, robot, weird car guys. I mean, your Instagram is full of just some of the coolest stuff that you have done. It's um, a treasure trove. True. So that's how. Thank you. So, um, just real quick for anyone listening, I honestly didn't know that John worked for Honda until two days ago. I only <laughs> knew about his Instagram, and that's why we invited him on the show because it's so amazing. And yeah, it's a so Bruce Wayne I, uh, Batman situation, I guess. I guess so. Yeah, but Batman or the all the stuff you do on your Instagram, like you do amazing stuff, and that's why I contacted you initially. To be honest with you, just because. Uh, we're going to be, uh, so we're primarily an audio podcast, but we also have a visual component. So anyone watching on YouTube, I'm going to be popping up some images of John's work here. And, and we should, is, oh, we should also point out the, uh, uh, the, his Instagram account is at Fry work F R Y E W E R K. And yep. yeah, there, I mean, I've, I have it pulled up right now, Bruce, I'll let you, I'll let you talk for a little bit while I just kind of just nerd out over the stuff I'm looking at here. <laughs> Fantastic. So John, um, give us just, I, I, so I know you're from Ben, Oregon. I looked at your website. You graduated from the art center with the bachelor's of science with honors, but kind of give us a little bit more of your background that you wouldn't necessarily have on your website. Okay. Yeah. Well, 
my childhood with, uh, you know, along with a lot of other people is that, that weird fascination with wheeled vehicles, cars, mm -hmm. you know, it starts with a wheel, I guess we get kind of mesmerized by it when we're a little toddler or something. But, um, I loved, uh, all sorts of vehicles. Um, so when I was growing up, uh, kind of the couple things that had a big impact on me were the, the movies that I was seeing. And at the time, uh, battle of Britain, uh, was probably running on TV quite a bit. And I saw mm -hmm. that and the world war II planes had a big influence on me. And then also on TV at the time was, uh, uh black sheep squadron. Oh boy. 1970. I mean, this will, this will date me for sure. And uh, of course the F4U Corsair was the, the hero vehicle of that TV show. And so I had an obsession about, you know, World War II airplanes for sure. Um, I got to ask you, I got to ask you a quick question there. Uh, just because you mentioned black sheep squad, I was the executive director for, uh, for the South Dakota air and space foundation for a little bit, which is a oh, nice. foundation that supports the air and space museum out here. So I'm, I'm kind of an airplane guy. Did, did you know that? Did you know that the original Pappy Boynton was actually on the show? He, he, he had uh, a as a regular. Of, uh, he wasn't a regular, but he had a he had a couple of guest spots. He wasn't playing himself. He was playing yeah. like like one of the higher up generals. But yeah, the original Pappy Boyington was on Black Sheep Squad. I learned that like five like like five years ago. Yeah, and it's and awesome. it stuck with me ever since. It's like I mean, oh yeah, Black Sheep Squad. Anyways, sorry sorry for the tangent. Yeah, my my dad was in the Air Force, and so he was a plane nut as well. And uh, he actually would get these these uh like air classics magazines all the time and i would pour through those and look at all the old wrecked planes and uh, the vintage photographs of the planes at the time and so all the military stuff was kind of like my my big obsession like when i was in kindergarten and i was drawing all the time as well so you know even in kindergarten people are, are like asking me are you going to be an artist when you grow up <laughs> and i i hated the term artist because my four to five year old vision of an artist was uh, um, Picasso, you know, dying penniless and killing himself. <laughs> so yeah. I, I, I wanted to draw f like for a living, not for, for dying. So my, my idea was, you know, I want to be a successful artist and uh, have, you know, enjoyment in it and uh, find fun things to do. So this is, you know, mid seventies, I have my obsession for military stuff. Um, and, uh, star Wars comes out in 77 and, mm -hmm. you know, this is a mind warp for, you know, kids that, you know, mm -hmm. people that were kids my age to see that because there was nothing of that level of kind of imagination and realistic quality that preceded that. Um, you know, we had star Trek on TV. Uh, 2001 a space odyssey you know a five-year-old kid you know is going to be pretty mesmerized by it if they can you know stay awake you know that's a lot for a little kid to wrap their head around but you know that was geared for you know short attention span you know kid eating a, a box of junior mints and you know with with that imagination i'm building legos i'm playing with die cast cars and all that stuff and then all of a sudden like wow spaceships like this is <laughs> this is hot stuff um but what that brought on and what got me into my career so you know i didn't want to be a fine artist and i got you know all sorts of great books from my my parents my grandparents my aunt and uncle you know for birthday presents because they knew i was as a kid like to draw so they they got me some great uh sketchbooks you know how did they draw all the star wars and design all that stuff and i realized that that's a career to like take marker and pen and sketch on paper and design spaceships. Um, but at the time I'm thinking, you know, 1983 comes around, you know, this is kind of on my mind of what I want to do when I grow up related to art. And I didn't know that there was a huge career connected to that type of drawing until I got another book from my parents um, called Rapid Viz. Um, that was done by some professors at an industrial design school in Utah. Um, I remember the school offhand, but um, I saw that type of drawing and I'm like, this is the same style of drawing that they used for the Star Wars movies. And it's like, mm -hmm. there's a whole other career of designing other things in the world, like toasters and 
uh, telephones and uh, cars in there as well. And like, that's what I want to be drawing for a living. How do I get into this? And um, funnily enough, you know, I'm, I'm drawing all the time and, and trying to figure out, it's like, okay, maybe I'm going to go to school in Utah and go to industrial design school. And in high school, I had a great mechanical drawing teacher and uh, he let me kind of sketch stuff on my own. So I was doing the drafting board stuff, but then I was drawing cars, 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 cars all the time, all the time. I was kind of done with the, the spaceship stuff because Star Wars was done at that point. And there wasn't anything that was engaging me as much. And, you know, all the vehicles still, I'm just doing a little bit of everything. And my art teacher's uh, room in high school, he had a big uh table in the middle that he would put uh the still lifes on uh, a bowl of fruit or whatever you're drawing and that that table <laughs> was like this old rickety table and he had a book shoved under the uh the table leg and uh one day i like pulled it out and i looked at it and it was the catalog for art center college of design in pasadena mm. and i looked at it and this was not only an industrial design uh school but it was a specialized school for doing um, transportation design, car design. They also had a yacht design pro uh, program as well. But, uh, you know, all these super spectacular vellum renderings of vehicles, you know, just jumped off the page. And they had, uh, I wish I still had the catalog it's because it was, it was such a big impact on me as well. So this is one of those kind of aha moments. But they had like a, a picture of the uh, student um, uh, they call it the senior room where they put up all their drawings. They work on their clay models and stuff. And it was just a mess of, you know, midterm kind of, uh, anxiety and action and stuff. And you could see all the cans of spray paint and spray fix and chalks and markers and, and the types of papers they use. And I'm like, this is all the information I need if I can kind of look at it and see what tools they're using. Cause I was, I was seeing some of these sketches in like road and track and, and some mm -hmm. of these other car mags that show the, the concept sketches, but um, to see how they kind of did it um, was really important. And like, I got to go to that school. That's where I want to go. And, you know, I was so obsessed with cars um, at that age that I was like, I'm going to get into a car studio, even if it means I'm the janitor. And you know, <laughs> in high school, I, I was, that was my, my job. Anyway, I was, I was doing janitorial stuff as a little side job to save up money for college. So it's like, I just want to be in the design studio. That's the, the place I want to be is I want, I want to see a car come to life. And, uh, you know, people need to understand the distinction also of car design. So there's, there's two people that kind of call themselves car designers and there's stylists, which to some people that's a bad word because it just kind of implies that uh, you're only making things look pretty. Um, and then there's engineers, uh, but both want to be called designers because rightly so both are thinking a lot about the whole essential problem. Nobody's doing anything superficial, either styling or engineering. So, um, you know, that's, I was getting into the styling aspect of things of things. So um, I didn't want to be an architect. I didn't want to be an engineer because I don't like doing math. I, don't <laughs> it, but, you know, I hear like, you. My, yeah. my whole dream is you. to like just draw cars all my life. So, you know, how do I get into doing that? So yeah, art center was three years of, um, you know, people that I go through that, they call it uh, um, like a boot camp. It's so, it's an art boot camp of sorts, you know, lots of long nights and uh, grown men crying and uh, <laughs> cut off fingers, with exacto knives and all sorts of drama, you know, people passing out during uh, uh, crits and, <laughs> you know, it's, it's a place of million stories, just a fantastic place. And then, you know, all the, the design greats for the most part um, have gone through there, um, particularly, you know, in North America. Right. Uh, you know, it's a, it's college a well for creative studies as well, you know, well-known uh, school, super, super great school. Um, I was lucky to finally get to do a little bit of teaching there through the powers of zoom, uh, last term. Oh, nice. Um, but, uh, you know, I'm a West coast guy, so I didn't want to head out to Detroit to go to school. So that was kind of the deciding factor on that. But yeah, our center really got me where I needed to be. And, uh, yeah, I tell you a lot of people that go through there, it's like, you know, that's 
it's such a great experience. You know, you meet all these wonderful people and you know, realize what a small community um, the whole car design world is. So, you know, I have I have friends at all other different companies and, you know, we can talk and share our general gripes, but, uh, <laughs> you know, we, we can't really talk about what we do, unfortunately. Right. Um, but, uh, you know, we we laugh about, you know, the struggles that the industry has and that sort of thing. But uh, at the same time, you know, I still have that creative fire in me that keeps me sketching late at night um, and on the weekends and everything and, you know, dreaming up new ideas all the time. Well, I mean, it shows your Instagram is fantastic. Um, if, if I could, let me ask you a question about process. Uh, a few years ago, I had the opportunity to talk with uh, David Kimball. I don't know if, if you're... Oh, yeah, the uh, cutaway are, 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 artist. Yeah, mm-hmm. familiar with uh, with him. Uh, Motor One was doing a series of, of some of his cutaway art, and I had a chance to talk with him about his process. And his process of starting that is, is just... I mean, it's like old school and insanely detailed where it's like, well, I'll start with some lines here and then we'll lay this over and then we'll do something else. And we'll lay this over. And it's like, I, I mean, he's, he's drawing a bolt mm-hmm. under an engine cover under a hood of a car. Um, yeah. When, when you're sitting down to come up with something new, whether it's um, just something creative for fun or something in depth, I mean, how how do you even begin on something like this? Well, I mean, my whole philosophy that I've arrived at and my, my process has changed over the years for sure, but um, I'm in the, the whole idea of start messy and uh, finish clean now. <laughs> and uh, it's like writing. <laughs> kind of firing different parts of your brain at the beginning. And, you know, part of this, this artwork that I have on Instagram is um, breaking away from the constraints of, of reality. So, um, you know, the, the auto design world is, is based on a lot of really important feasibility, you know, consumer safety being, you know, priority one. Um, then we have all the NHTSA uh, guidelines of, you know, um, pedestrian impact. Um, we have a lot of aero things we have to consider for, for drag and getting, you know, fuel numbers really good. And, you know, all this, this stuff, um, what I'm doing, my own stuff, I can totally forget about that. And, you know, what does a car look like if it doesn't have any passengers in it? Um, what if we do a race series where, um, the drag number of the car is actually, there's a minimum number. You can't make the lowest drag car you want, or you have a uh, downforce has to be uh, neutral, for example. And, you know, what would the cars look like if we didn't let uh, that Pandora's box get opened up? Um, so I'm juggling, I'm always juggling a lot of things in my mind, um, but I try to focus on new form at the very beginning of things. So, I mean, this is as different from cutaway drawings as you can mm-hmm. get. And I've, I've talked to those guys before. Tony Matthews is another super talented one. He's a, a British based uh, cutaway guy. And, um, you know, the research that, that they have to do to understand all the mechanical things that are happening under the skin of the car and, you know, the perspective you put it in. Uh, so a little bit of overlap when I kind of am sketching initially. So I'm, I'm thinking about what's an exciting new form. What's the silhouette, um, you know, the, the background, how it interplays with the outline of the car, you know, getting little splashes of light poking through suspension elements, um, you know, you get kind of that lacy uh, pattern of light that comes through there. You know, we don't want everything just to be a a jelly bean. Um, You know, that's not so interesting and attractive. We want an interesting kind of outline. There's a lot of um, music kind of analogies that go with this. And there's been, you know, some, some great kind of designers that have some music background in the industry. So yeah, this, uh, Nakama Kuroyama that's on the screen right now. That's a good example. So this is like a 1960s style thing. And we have all the suspension elements in the back. We have like the torsion tube and uh, that vertical element through there. And there's all sorts of pokes of light coming through there. So even if I uh, just black that car out against a white background, it's got an interesting distinctive shape that makes you go, oh, that's interesting. That's And it's different too. You know, I went for a a tall fuselage instead of a wide fuselage. So I'm trying to do something different all the time. 
Um, so that's kind of key one. And in this initial phase, you know, I'm starting with little scribbles. So this is the messy uh, side of things. And there's a little bit of a pareidolia. So uh, this is like being able to look at clouds and see like an elephant kind of in the cloud. So I'll, mm -hmm. I'll kind of blob a, a fat gray marker on paper uh, just with a general idea of perspective and where the wheels are at and kind of let things happen. And then I'll come in with a, like a fine line ballpoint pen and start to kind of see things in there and and kind of read into it. Um, and it's 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 a really kind of analog right brain process at the early stage of things. Um, but at that initial stage, I also have an idea of what I want for my my whole uh, breadth of work to supplement that, you know. Um, I, I'll do a series of vehicles. So I've, I've done kind of these construction vehicles turned into uh, sports cars. Um, and I want to make sure that I, I do enough to kind of exhaust kind of some of those directions. So if I haven't done one of those in a while, maybe I'll do one of those. And, um, you know, like I said, you know, I'll see a like, trash truck. Like, I want to do a trash truck, you know, all sorts of kind of commercial vehicles. And I, 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 I like to focus on the the world building instead of world destroying so when i'm teaching the students the entertainment design stuff the video games and movies there's so much emphasis put on um kind of violence hardware <laughs> that i don't think i need to add to that i i like looking at that stuff and uh, i just don't think i need to design more of that so most of my vehicles are you know race competition or you know the whole kind of uh, vehicles that are around our world to make the, the country go, you know, transportation, you know, heavy, uh, heavy lifting, you know, uh, hauling stuff around, you know, building bridges, that sort of thing. That's interesting to me. So if I can build on that real quick, and Smith, I know you had a question, but this, no, this go, go ahead, something. Go ahead. Um, so I know from your bio on your website, you said you worked at Activision for a while, and mm -hmm. I tried looking you up on the Game Developer Research Institute, which is kind of the IMDB of video games, and I couldn't find you. So did you yeah. actually work on any video games and design stuff, or did they? Yeah, that was out? that was a really brief thing. Uh, my my roommate uh, James, who went on to be. Um, he was a, a concept design guy and he's in uh, Star Wars end of thing designing stuff. Oh, cool. He graduated right before me and he went to Activision and um, I had graduated just after him and I hadn't gotten a job yet. And he's like, do you want to come to Santa Monica and, and sketch vehicles? I'm like, yeah, sure. Let's do it. Of course. And uh, so this is before, you know, just right after I got a school before I started Honda and uh, I worked on a project that uh, it just never got off the ground is is one of those that was dead in the water at some point. Um, mm -hmm. But it was a lot of fun. So uh, that was the analog uh, days of design. And I had a big ream of uh, eight and a half by 11 paper and a whole bunch of markers. And I was just cranking out these uh, hovercraft uh, wasteland oh, okay. uh, kind of Mad Maxi uh, vehicles. And oh, boy, there was like oh, that uh, sounds battle fantastic. platforms and stuff. Yeah. But that was the uh, also the low polygon days of things. So this is late is 90s. This like placed, oh, so like PlayStation 1 kind of era. Yeah, I, don't, I can't remember what the the platform was kind of geared for. But I remember some of the, the early sketches I was doing, I was considering, you know, low poly, um, mm -hmm. making the design work with low poly. And they're saying, oh, just don't worry about it. Just sketch as you would. And then we'll figure out how to model that later. Um, but yeah, the... There was actually, a, uh, I did a Vespa pizza delivery hover craft thing, and it, <laughs> it just came to mind because the new Boba Fett series came out. Exactly, and, yeah. You know, yep. People were freaking about uh, about the uh, the mod the Vespas with all the mirrors and stuff, and how out of place they were. <laughs> kind of breaking the uh, the fourth wall, I guess, mm -hmm. and getting a little bit too uh, referential to uh, the world we live in right now, I guess. I don't know. I thought it was kind of neat. Now, now yeah. we're in a danger zone because now we're about to start talking about Star Wars. <laughs> and, but, and wait, no, but we I need own, a bigger podcast or, for that. My dad owns a Vespa GS150 from 69. So we got a Vespa owner, a Star Wars fan, and a guy who has designed a Vespa. So 
Yeah. Before be, I send this, this go places. <laughs> and and I'll take I'll take credit for sending this completely off the rail. So before I do that, let me ask you a question. How many I mean, how often are you drawing? Is this like something you do like every day, maybe once a week? And, and when I say how often, I mean, like, um, you know, the, the stuff that we're seeing on Instagram, just a, a lot of the really special, uh, the special stuff. In fact, I'm going to share one right now um, because I loved the the comment you did on this one where it's just like, yeah, I was just, I was just sitting in the car with nothing to do. I just doodle in this in my lap. And it's like the coolest freaking like cyberpunk trained I've ever seen. Yeah. I, I remember doing this. This was, uh, my wife was, uh, in a store or something and I, I just was going to sit in the car and sketch it. So I, I hadn't done any trains. And after I did this, my, my friend, uh, Alice, uh, she commented on the, uh, the whole thing about the layout of wheels, which, you know, I hadn't done train design before and she knew more than I do. So my, my subsequent mm -hmm. trains are a little bit more engineered accurately, but this was kind of a fun thing to do. So it's interesting because I ended up doing some, some train sketches for a friend. You want me to do some uh, later, but yeah, in terms of like how much sketching I do. Uh, I mean, if you're I, doing it in the car, I guess all the time, right? Yeah. Yeah, I, I I have uh, come up with ideas and sketched something at a stoplight roughly before I'll have to wow. admit that. Um, okay. Sorry. Uh, no, no. As possible, but yeah, nothing That's to fine. this level. Uh, yeah, generally, I usually have uh, just scrap paper next to me at all times and a pen. And uh, when files are loading, uh, when I'm uh, eating breakfast or having lunch or, you know, sitting at the TV, um, I'm just scribbling something and, and the stuff that I do just as kind of idea generation is really not pretty stuff. It's, this is the messy kind of side of things, but I'm able to, you know, derive something from it. I'm like, would this work if I, you know, move the mass this way? And if I had, you know, the wheel over here and cover the wheel, uh, you know, have an angular line, I'm, I'm thinking about things along the way and, you know, I'll just churn tons of this stuff out and then, you know, after a whole bunch of drawings, there's there's one that's like, oh yeah, that's the one that I need to render up, uh, really nice, and uh, you know, so there's there's a lot of trash uh, created first before you know the nice stuff, and then you know the nice stuff, it's you know every couple of weeks uh, if I have time, because uh, it, it does take a lot of time you know in front of the computer to you know do the finished color pieces. You and are making admit, me. The, you know, the creative energy is just like, you know, running a marathon. You, you have it for a while and then you need to take breaks for, you know, a couple of days or, you know, a week sometimes. And you're like, you're not, you know, producing anything that's worth a uh, while. And so that's a time to kind of recharge your creative battery and, mm -hmm. you know, watch some movies and, and that sort of thing get going again. Yeah. But it sounds like you're the captain America of creative, <laughs> of creativity. You're making me feel terrible because I, same here. I, 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 I graduated <laughs> with a degree in creative writing and I've, I have two novels that I've been working on for a while, oh, nice. but the, I, I, obviously the daily job of daily news, it's like I get done after nine hours or so. I am out of this office, no matter how many robots and cool stuff I have in here. It's like, <laughs> I'm out of this office and I don't even want to look at a keyboard or a computer until the next day. And you're just, you're doing it constantly. That's awesome. And Bruce, I, I don't know how you read my mind every time because John, as you were well, talking no, you about you shared the, this and I just, I popped it up for you, bud. Oh, this is the, Oh, I shared it. Okay. You did. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay, well, I, I didn't think I'm I'm so fascinated. I didn't think I clicked the button. Um, you you were talking about the the just kind of the the messy stuff versus the nice stuff. So as soon as you said mm -hmm. that, I had to click over to your beautiful Honda S800 uh, uh, sketch here. Uh, can yeah. Can you tell us a little bit just just about the process of creating this? And on a personal note, that this is uh, just an absolutely gorgeous car um, yeah. that that doesn't get nearly enough attention. I think in the world, the, the older Honda S 800 is just, mm -hmm. it's just timeless and amazing. Tell us about this, about this, this drawing here. Well, this was one of those kind of fun projects I get to do every once in a while when, uh, um, I, I do a gift rendering for somebody. And this was, uh, somebody that I worked with that was, uh, finished with his time 
uh, with working with us and was headed back to Japan. Um, hmm. So in my mind, of course, I wanted to do some sort of Honda product that he had mm -hmm. some some relation to with, you know, we have infinity for it. Um, the US flag is on there uh, to remind him of his time working with us. Um, in terms of process, uh, you know, I, I love the 1960s style um, dive backgrounds that they were doing. They're doing a lot of psychedelic stuff in the auto studios, particularly uh, uh, the Detroit studios um, with the new marker dies that are coming out. Super, super toxic stuff, unfortunately. <laughs> uh, you can't get um, some of those anymore. So this is kind of a recreation of that, that kind of effect. And so I do a lot of analog texture stuff. So um, my first one I experimented with, I was doing um, soy sauce in soy milk on a white plate. And then I was, you know, taking my 35 millimeter camera and, and taking wow. pictures of it. And then, oh. you know, importing it to Photoshop and uh, using overlay, you can kind of tweak the color. You can, you can invert it. So the, the dark becomes light, vice versa. And uh, this background is, is built up of a lot of uh, alcohol dyes on um, uh, plastic uh, paper. Um, so it, it really lets stuff pool pretty nicely. Um, and then that's all scanned in and then you can, you know, color tone stuff. And so the uh, contrast of, you know, a mechanical object that's something in this perfect form and especially the purity of a white car and beautiful car, classic car like this against, you know, a very analog kind of wild background. It's a really nice uh, kind of interplay. And then, you know, the, the detail on this, you know, I, I'm always trying to make stuff look hand done. So there's a little bit of guilt about working in the digital world all the time because, you know, it's so much easier than the days of working with gouache and having to, to clean brushes and uh, use airbrushes and not having the undo key and all that stuff. Um, so I'm trying to get back to an analog feel to things. I don't want things to look like perfectly digital. Um, so you see there's some vertical kind of strokes that are going through there and that's all just, you know, uh, stylus in hand and sketching. So a lot of this is, is really just, you know, wrist, wrist action, just as if I'm coloring with a colored pencil, but I'm doing it on a screen instead. Um, and it's then, you know, the, the color combo was something I wanted to do. I don't think this exists in any form, but, uh. I'm like, if I had this car, this is kind of how I want to set it up. So there's exactly. like the RSC wheels. Uh, uh, I had a Timia uh, remote control kit of this this version. And uh, mm -hmm. I think these are the wheels that they raced for the, the Nürburgring uh, 12 hour or something that Honda won uh, with this car. I was getting mixed up with the S600 and the S800, which, which one won at that race, but... Um, yeah, this, this is a great car. The, Jay Leno drives one iteration of it, and the engine is just spectacular. It's a yes, ten to eleven thousand yeah. RPM car, I believe. And I and I want to point out your air floor, your air force, your air force influence shows in the correct use of the American flag. Yeah, the stripes are always are always going with the wind. Yeah, how many of the <laughs> issue with that because. Basically, all my vehicles drive to the uh, the right side of the page, um, mm -hmm. and that's because uh, famous Ravel box artist uh, Jack uh, Linwood. That's how he instructed people to do that, and is when he was teaching art center back in the seventies. Oh, uh, he said basically, I, it's the way that our brain works, and I think it's from the way that we read um, mm -hmm. that if a vehicle is going that way, it looks like it's moving. Uh, there's more movement to it. So all my vehicles go that way. And then any, anytime I put a U.S. flag on there, um, it goes the backwards way to be correct. And every time I do that, I know when I post it, somebody's going, oh, your flag's backwards. And I have to like, <laughs> nope. correct them to no, the proper way correct. of doing nope. it. Yeah. I said, look yeah. at the space shuttle, look at Air Force One on the, uh, yep. the starboard side. And that's uh, the way that it's done. Yeah. So we only have about 10 minutes left, but I... You talked about your influences regarding Star Wars and things like that, but can you say anything about your more recent influences, even, you know, 90s, 2000s, even in today? What kind of influences the look of your work? We 
uh, before we started recording, uh, officially, we talked about Kao Yokoyama, who is a, a, a Japanese designer who does certain things. I can certainly see certain influences from maybe like anime from you mentioned it earlier from like uh, Mad Max Fury Road. Like where where do you see influences from these days? Yeah, I mean, I draw so much of my influences from it's it's not so much contemporary stuff, but even my my recent influences, um, it's it's all over the place. So, um, I I don't know where the design stuff comes from as much, but these days I'm looking at a lot of uh, rendering technique. Um, oh, and okay. The way that the guys were illustrating, um, and you know how they're doing things. But for design stuff, I'm looking at you know all sorts of uh, you know sci-fi. Uh, stuff architecture of course um mm -hmm. you know, for illustration there's the you know the fits and van on my wall uh sid mead of course is a big oh one but God, yeah <laughs> oh there's uh, I was gonna... talked about sid mead a lot on this show yes oh, we sid have mead is fantastic. I, I was gonna i was gonna call out a little bit on that on the uh, uh I, I can't remember which one you posted up there bruce but it's like yeah that's a th that looks like something that looks like something from me <sighs> <laughs> yeah, I am depressed. Yeah. I never got to interview him. I was obviously in the industry at that time, but never at kind of a point where I could have asked him. And man, that's someone who I would have loved to talk to. Yeah, designers generally, you know, want to be able to design like Sid Mead, but like I want to be able to draw like Sid Mead, but at the same time, I have to fight to make sure that I'm not doing his designs so sure. i'm like yeah uh, it's it, it's so hard because he covered so many bases and you know he's just so in, influential that it's hard to get away with with what he was doing and try to do something new so like off the top of my head all these aircraft artists that i'm like obsessed with like right, uh, right now uh, roy huxley did all the matchbox uh uh covers oh uh, box, i'm not familiar with them okay um, i'll have to look at that uh, there's a great book just came out um, from uh, Red Kite Publishing last last year. It's fantastic okay. work. And all, all these guys, you know, you can see their techniques. So it's not super polished. You can see their brushwork in there. Mm -hmm. uh, Cuneo is a guy that did a bunch of uh, like train artwork and he did a lot of vintage racing stuff. And mm -hmm. he's an old school guy. He was doing stuff with oil paints like uh, Peter Helk as well. He was doing um, automotive illustration with uh, with oils um yeah design stuff i mean the stuff that really kind of floats my boat is is the the anime stuff for sure um the vintage stuff in the 80s i have some uh orgus uh stuff pinned to my my influence oh board oh right, yeah right now which is it's like macross but it's all kind of bubbly and yep uh, you know the illustration that get went with it are just spectacular so are are you excited like me over the Harmony Gold Big West thing where we can now get this. legit Macross stuff in the United States? That was like one of the happiest days of my life. I've been a huge Macross fan forever. Macross Robotech. Yeah. I know I the I know if I say Macross and Robotech together, some some portion of the world is supposed to explode. I appreciate both for what they are, but right. Oh man. Yeah, the, the, the story is a little bit confusing very it's very <laughs> confusing oh, yeah <laughs> yeah and, At and least even in this like the, the history of transformers brand as well because you know there were transformers that were you know robotech oh yeah i've, I've got some of them messes stuff up i've, Jet I've got them behind me here yeah 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 we, we can talk off offline about that <laughs> <laughs> that's that's a that's like another four hour podcast you just did the chris smith dog whistle right there yeah Woo, that's, huh? you're good <laughs> yeah yeah for, for design influences just to kind of close that out it's i i try to avoid looking at too much stuff i i have met so many great other kind of illustrators and designers through social media and their stuff it's again it's it's hard not to be influenced by them because they're doing so cool stuff like i'm i'm going to be teaching uh next term at uh, concept design academy with uh, darren quatch and uh you know his stuff was just i got his book years and years ago before i ever met him and it's just like it's such an honor to you know have him as a a co-worker and a you know co-creator you know it's fantastic so you know his stuff and and when i was going to school uh nick Pugh was 
like the guy that everybody was referencing. He was like the, the next Sid Mead at, at Art Center in the, the 90s. And his stuff, you know, people had, you know, photographs of it at the time. There wasn't, you know, internet collections of, of their stuff. It was all, you know, marker and gouache and chalk on vellum, like the way we used to do it. And people had photographs of it and they would photocopy the photographs and you'd have all this <laughs> like third generation stuff. And you'd be looking at it like, how did he do that? Like, uh, you know, his favorite, my favorite piece of his, it was like, uh, he did a, um, uh, propane powered Mazda or something. I can't remember the exact scope of the project, but there was a tip up view of it. And it kind of had this, um, uh, kind of nautical looking shaped body and, uh, the rear hatch was open and you could see like velocity stacks and there was a stainless steel aluminum tub in there that was reflecting into itself and it's all marker and gouache and chalk and colored pencil and just like how did he do that and i you know i finally got to meet him a couple of years you know through social media and he's he's doing movie industry stuff and you know all these people they, they do cool stuff and you know i i don't take what they're doing and try to copy it and just i just want to you know, take that creative energy. It's like, yeah, I want to do something cool too. Oh, yeah. uh, like Von Ling, you know, I worked with him, you know, uh, teaching and stuff. And, you know, he's doing all sorts of creative stuff. You know, he went through the automotive design world, came from, I think, CCS, College for Creative Studies. And then he got into entertainment design. And now he's designing his own digital sketching program. And, you know, there's so many cool people doing cool stuff. And I think social media has has kind of exposed a lot of people that were, you know, doing work and sketching and doing their own thing and not, you know, you know, being able to share any of that. And we really kind of influence and empower each other through all the stuff we're doing. You know, mm -hmm. it's it's uh, it's amazing that how many talents are out there. So there, there's, you know so many more people like me that are sketching on a coffee table and producing cool stuff. Mm -hmm. And we're all the trying internet, to do our man. own thing. Yeah. The internet, internet changed everything. It, yeah. it changed everything. So we only have about five minutes left, but I just want to heat praise on you for one more thing. So I hope you enjoy, enjoy that. But you did this <laughs> post on Instagram where you showed off your, uh, your Seiko John player special, which they were never actually sponsored by John player special, but, yeah. um, uh, that watch, it just has the right color scheme. And then you have a, uh, a vehicle to go. Oops, I pressed the wrong button there. Uh, you have a kind of a rendering to go with it. And I just love that combo. It's, it's perfect. Oh, it's it. I love it. I, lo I love the idea of thinking about a, an autonomous car in what late 1970s and the way that you do it. It's, yeah, I I know Smith and I are just like heaping praise on you during this whole show, but uh, your work is so impressive and your inspirations are so interesting that it's just been fun. Uh, well, and and Bruce and I, I mean, full disclosure, Bruce and I are both model builders. Oh, yes. um, I, I've been oh, in yeah. I've I've been in RC cars off and on. So a lot of the work that you have on your Instagram page, you have these really cool, interesting designs, but then you do it up. As if you're looking at box art on a model exactly. kit or an yeah. RC yeah. car. And I think it's just a brilliant, it's just a brilliant take on creating something interesting and then putting it in its own interesting background. Yeah, I've, I've been I've been building yeah. models for 30 You've years. You've clearly looked at a lot of Tamiya box art in your day, yeah. I can tell. <laughs> and this this taps into the whole longing feeling when you're a kid because you know you'd see all those kits in the store. And it's like you can only have one. Exactly. Like, I want all yeah. of them. No, that's no, that's that's not too. true. Like, I have about thirty in this little office. You just well, you can see one at a time. Built, right? I've got a bunch too, but you're gonna have one at a time. <laughs> yeah, yeah. These days, you can get the 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 pre built diecast stuff that's at a level that's the finish of you know. Yeah, that's from, no fun you know, though. You got to build it yourself. Like yeah, yeah. Bruce, so, somebody went through the pain of doing that. And they had the imperfections are what makes it perfect in a certain way. That like yeah. that. Oh my God, I screwed up this little bit, but you're like, no, you create this, this head can in your mind. Like, no, I didn't screw it up. The person who drove it, they hit this <laughs> curve in the way, way. And that's why <laughs> yeah. it's wrong. That's when you yeah. just bust out the lighter. You melt the plastic down a little bit. I meant to do it that way. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. Create your own backstory. Oh yeah. boy. 
Well, well John, I, I, we're just about to the, to the end here. I want to thank you very much for joining us. Um, I mentioned your Instagram page, um, F R Y E W E R K folks. You definitely want to go and follow and just look at all the work that's going on there. Is there any, anywhere else, any websites, anything that you would like to shout out uh, to the listeners um, to, to let them follow along with what you're doing? Um, uh, I have frywork.com. I don't mm-hmm. update that quite as much, but um, for the people that are kind of in the industry who want to see higher resolution stuff, um, I have an art station page. Okay. Uh, that will come up. You, if you type in Fry and Art Station, you'll find it in there. So you can see things in a little bit more detail than you do in Instagram. But Instagram is kind of my my feed that I put all my my crap on all the time as much as possible. Got to feed feed the social media machine, otherwise it forgets about you. Oh, um, oh it, it, it forgot I, I, about I, me a while ago. I, yeah, I, there, there's I, an I, algorithm in there that it, it seems to drop off your visibility if you aren't putting enough stuff on there. So. I mean, I got to be honest, that's where I found you. Like I said, I think it was a machine in Krieger site. Someone linked to your work and that's where I saw you. Yeah, that was neat. I mean, ago. that's another person I, I met online is Kao Yukiyama. He's like, he liked my work on when I had stuff on Flickr at some point. Um, <laughs> it's like, holy cow. You know, I think <laughs> yeah, the world nice. is so much you know, smaller. Yeah, I met Sid Mead several times. Yeah, oh. All these people that you... You, it just it just closes the loop a little bit and we're not so isolated so that's that's fantastic but i'm i'm always happy when somebody like takes one of my sketches and they go i made a 3d model of this or i, I made it in lego you know some oh. people do that or that they'll pan fabricate stuff um mm-hmm. you know it's it's amazing and it, it's such you know an honor that people are influenced to create when they they see my work so uh, that always makes me happy cool well uh i know I hope everyone who is listening enjoyed this interview. I know Smith and I did. This has been a lot of fun. Um, So as always, good afternoon, good evening, or good night. We appreciate all your comments, all your likes, all your subscribes, everything like that. But this has just been, this has been a fun one. So thanks to everyone and good night and goodbye. Bye-bye. Thanks, guys.